Once again, good morning and hello everyone. Uh, my name is Braden Korowitz. I am the ARC Power Program Coordinator. Um, and welcome back to the second of three installments of ARC's new Power Grantee series. Um, today we'll be, we will hear from ARC Deputy General Counsel Nancy Isle, who will walk us through the legal issues for new Power Grantees covering all matters of grants administration and regulations. Um, as we go through this, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box below uh, to submit any questions you might have. We should have some time at the end to answer a handful of your questions. Um, if we don't get to your question or if your question is specific to your project, don't worry. Um, we are keeping tabs on those and we'll follow up with you directly. Lastly, um, this has been asked a few times already, um, but this presentation is being recorded and the recording and the content shared will be distributed to everyone on the registration list, so no worries. That will make its way to you once we have that cleaned up and prepared. Um, and with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Nancy Isle um, and off we go. Thanks, Nancy. Hi, everybody. Um, great to see you all today. I am going to be giving you a overview, an overview of the, of the federal regulations and the um, requirements that you need to follow in order to um, complete your project successfully. I'm really here to demystify the rules and regulations that apply and to put them into plain English for you because we recognize that reading the regulations is a bit overwhelming. There are a lot and there's a lot of legalese. That's why I'm going to try to break them down for you in a way that you can understand and also to talk a little bit about what's important, really important as you um, not only perform your award and think about those performance goals, but also think about compliance. Um, with the idea of a potential audit. So on that note, we even have a visit from our inspector general at the end, he'll be talking. We have several video stars who'll be asking questions and we have some Insta polls for you. Um, and as Braden mentioned at the beginning, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, that way we'll be able to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. We're not really monitoring the chat box. If we don't, for some reason, get to all of your questions, that's uh, no problem. We will make sure we answer them after the presentation. Um, so let's go on to uh, an Insta poll, one of the most important questions as we start. So just take 30 seconds to answer this Insta poll. Have you read your ARC grant agreement? Just a couple seconds. This is our simplest Insta poll. Fantastic. Well, I have to say fantastic that nearly 70% of you have read um, the grant agreement, but if you haven't, don't worry. Um, I want to explain some things to you here and you can go and um, look at it after the presentation. We'll also talk about where to find, um, where to find your grant agreement. Um, so next slide, please. So the grant agreement is like a contract and it applies to you and it applies to us. Um, that's why really everything starts with this grant agreement. You'll have to read it um, and be really familiar with it. Um, and that's why I'm covering it at the beginning. I also think there's some things that you, um, you really need to know at the outset that will help you understand it better. Um, the grant agreement incorporates your proposal or your work plan, but the grant agreement says that your work and your project will be carried out, quote, in general accord um, with, your, with your plan. So um, while the contract or the grant agreement incorporates your work plan and proposal, it's not necessarily um, the case that every single thing that you say in your proposal and your full power application um, will be done exactly this way. Sometimes there might be minor deviations, and that's fine. That's something that you might need. Um, it might be COVID related. It could be other things. Um, somebody, a key person, leaves your organization, um, and there could be other major amendments. So for any changes, you'll want to work with um, your ARC project coordinator. Um, but sometimes there might be a conflict between something that you propose in your work agreement and um, a requirement like a regulation or something that, um, that we require, a rule. And in that case, um, what will happen is that the, uh, the regulations or the grant articles will control. So there, there might be necessary changes in your work plan. For example, 
if you proposed a sole source contract, um, that, that wouldn't be uh, possible. Um, we would say, you know, you have to go back and compete it. Um, next slide. So this is one of the um, first provisions in the grant agreement, and it's called the order of precedence. If you don't know what that means, that's why I'm here to explain it to you, because um, it's not exactly something that we say in our ordinary life. <laughs> uh, what it means is that, um, and there are five things in the order of precedence, and it means that if something, for example, in number one, and if there's a conflict with something in number four, the grant agreement, the, the, the highest, the one in the highest rung will trump those in the lower rung. So for example, nothing, um, the grant agreement, your project proposal, um, none of this can conflict with the Appalachian Regional Development Act, which is our authorizing statute enacted in 1965. That, um, that's our statute and nothing can, can contradict that. After that comes the ARC code, which, is, um, which are really our internal regulations and our project guidelines. And our code incorporates federal regulations that apply to all grants and subgrants awarded by the federal government. They're called um, the Uniform Guidance, and they are issued by the Office of Management Budget. Um, you can find these in Title II of the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 200. So that's what it means when you see 2 CFR um, Part 200 or 2 CFR 200 dot something, um, the specific regulations. It refers to this Uniform Guidance these federal regulations that are entitled to of the Code of Federal Regulations. And we'll talk in just a second about where to find all this stuff and including the regulations. On the third rung is your grant agreements special provisions. And that is where your work plan is incorporated, the specific um, project. Um, number four is the general provisions and they apply to all our projects across the board. They're kind of more generic. And five is the grant, grant administration manual. Um, so let's go to the next slide. This is where to find everything. Um, on our website, um, you can find ARDA, the code, project guidelines, and also the federal regulations, which we call 2, two CFR part 200. Um, just so you know about those regulations, we're putting them on our website soon um, the reason is that the regulations were recently amended and will take effect on November 12th of this year. And you all are grandfathered in to the regulations that we're talking about today. Because you signed your grant agreement before November 12th, you have these current regulations and the ones that will be found online starting on November 12th aren't the ones that will apply to you. So. That's why we're putting them on our website. You can go on our website and there'll be something that will say 2 CFR part 200 pre November 12th, 2020. Um, and then your grant agreement and the grant administration manual you can find on ARCnet. Um, that's under the documentation tab. The person who signed the grant agreement for your organization has already located the grant agreement to sign it. Um, if you don't know where to find it, or you can't um, somehow find a way to get onto ArcNet, let us know and we'll help you get onto ArcNet and help you find all of this stuff. This is also where you will be submitting your uh, reports. Um, you'll need to have access to ArcNet and access to the grant agreement. Um, but now we have a question from a colleague. Hey Nance, good to see you. Hey, we are so excited about our ARC grants, but Boy, there's a lot of moving parts to this. And honestly, I think we're gonna to have to get some help to help us figure all this out. So we'd like to maybe hire some folks with some of the grant dollars. To do that, is there anything special we need to keep in mind to make sure we follow the right rules and regulations? Thanks. Really good question. And probably a question that many of you have because if, if you can't do all the work yourself, you're going to have to get goods and services from others. Um, so, and we, we've also encouraged partnerships in power um, projects. So the, one of the questions that you really have to figure out at the beginning is whether your partner is a partner as in a subgrantee or is your partner a, contract, uh, a contractor. Um, that distinction is critical at the outset. Um, some, some of you might call everything a contract and always have 
Um, and the regulations discuss criteria to know which legal instrument you have to use. It's really an objective test, not always clear cut, but there are criteria to, to use to determine which um, instrument to use. And we'll tell you about this criteria today and also about why it's important to get this decision right. Next slide. The key to know um, about this contractor and subgrantee distinction is that it doesn't matter what you call it, even if you call it a contract, but it's a subgrant, it's going to be a subgrant. So just like this slide that's so silly, if it walks and quacks like a duck, it's a duck, even if you call it, you know, another type of bird. Um, next slide. Okay, so here's a, here's a table, and this table lists um, characteristics of a contractor and characteristics of a subrecipient. It's largely based on the regulation, which you can see at the top of your screen. It's 2 CFR 200.330. So specifically, specifically, you can look up that regulation and find characteristics um, that will help you. Um, but why are there so many characteristics? Because it's not always clear cut. On one side, you have on the contractor um, side, characteristics like um, a contractor normally provides um, services or goods during normal business hours, normally operates in a competitive environment. Um, normally the, the work isn't going to be critical to your grant. It's kind of as an aside to your grant and, and would provide similar goods or services to anybody who would pay. Um, in contrast, um, on the subrecipient side, um, that's more um, a, a partner who can, who will be making decisions on the direction of the grant, whose performance is measured according to the perimeters in the grant, just like yours is, and who can who can decide on who receives federal funds. Um, the most important factor, I think, to help make this decision is who um, the, is the goal of the relationship. If the goal of the relationship is to help you as an organization do something for your own good, like for example, accountancy or trash removal, or just reviewing your books or providing something that helps you as an organization that's not critical to the award, that's gonna be more likely a contract. And services that, um, is, is that services that are similar um, to the purpose of the award, the, public purpose for which the public funds were awarded, um, that is going to be more likely to be a subrecipient or a subgrantee. Um, why is this so important? Because first of all, the federal regulations in part 200 flow down to all subgrants. So all the subgrants have to comply with everything as well. That's really important. Um, because you need to, they need to know what they have to comply with in case they're audited and, and to be able to, to um, administer the project um, legally and, and properly. Um, contracts have to be competed and there's a provision in the regulations, it's in um, Appendix 2, that lists all the provisions that contracts have to include. Those things don't apply to subgrants. Subgrants don't have to be openly competed and they don't have to include those provisions in Appendix 2. And third, um, there are a lot more responsibilities on you as the grantee if you have a subgrantee, which we'll talk about today. So let's go to an Insta poll. Um, or actually, we are on a video from a colleague. Hi, Nancy. I have a couple of questions. Our power project will be implemented by three different partner organizations, but only my organization is listed as the grantee. Since we are all equal partners in doing this project, do we all have equal responsibilities in ARC's eyes? Also, if ARC selected our project for funding, does that mean our work plan is automatically approved by ARC and we can use the partners and contractors we listed in our power budget? Thanks. Two very good questions. Again, so we're gonna to talk today now about partners and so-called pass-through entities. Now, Many of you may never have heard of this term pass through entity. So let me tell you what it means because it is in the regulations. It basically is you. If you're a grantee and you have a subgrantee, you're going to be considered a pass through entity. 
So when you see um, the acronym PTE or pass through entities, what it means is that the federal funds pass through you to go to your subgrantee. Um, and the answer to the question about whether you have equal responsibilities with your partners, it's it's no. It's not. If you're if your name is on that grant agreement with us, you have enhanced responsibilities. You have more responsibility. Um, you have responsibility over the subgrantee. Um, and we'll talk about what that means. Um, there are certain things that you, you have to do. Um, regarding the second question, we kind of talked about this at the outset about when there might be a conflict between what you have in your work plan and what the federal regulations or the ARC code says. So again, just because you put something in your work plan or your project proposal, it doesn't mean that it's automatically stamped approved and later on, you can say, well, we put it in our, our project proposal and that justified, you know, the reason we did, let's say, a sole source contract. The example I used, if the IG comes in and says you did a sole source contract, it was improper, um, you know, we would, we, we, we would like to make sure that you know at the outset that if there is a conflict, you'll have to, um, to correct that. Um, let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit more about the requirements on you if you are a pass-through entity or essentially a grantee that has a sub-grantee. Um, number one thing, uh, monitor, monitor, monitor. You are required to monitor your sub-grantee and make sure that that sub-grantee sub complies with all the regulations. So you can see specifically what you have to do in this regulation that's on your slide, um, but th that's the key thing. Um, you'll have to make sure that your subgrantee gets a single audit, which we'll talk about in a minute, if that subgrantee is required to. And you want to make sure you include certain information on all your subawards. This is all described in the regulation. Um, so my tip for you is to make sure that you get all subgrants in writing. Um, and it, make sure that you incorporate all of 2 CFR 200 in your subawards. This will make your life a lot easier, and it will, it will also make your Subgrantees know that they have to comply with the subawards and will give make it very clear they know that they have to answer to you on how they're performing. Um, they have to submit reports to you. They have to make sure they comply with the regulations. But you also have the ability to ask for documents from them um, and to even take um, even take measures if if there are any compliant you know non-compliance issues. Certainly, let us know at this earliest possible opportunity if you're having any difficulties with the subgrantee, it's really much better to tell us at the outset rather than try to deal with it yourself. Um, that sometimes happens. So just know at the end of the day that um, if you're audited, um, you're gonna be responsible for the project. And so because your name is on that, that grant agreement, you wanna make sure that you keep a good, um, good oversight over your subgrantees. So let's go to the next slide. I mentioned the pass-through entities, the grantees have to make sure that the subgrantee gets a single audit as required, if required. It also applies to you. If you or your subgrantees expend, which means spend more than $750,000 in your fiscal year, you have to get this special audit. And you can look up subpart F in 2 CFR part 200 um, to, you know, to find out how to compete, how to procure such an auditor. Um, and it's really all of your federal awards. So you if you happen to get you know, $500,000 from USDA and you spend it all in your fiscal year and you spend $250,000 of ARC money in your fiscal year, that's what will trigger it. It's all your federal awards. Uh, but now we have a question from a colleague. Hi, Nancy. We'll be using some of our power grant money to buy computer stations for a new learning lab, and we'll need to hire someone to set up all the equipment. Should we go on Amazon and find the best deals, or can I stay local and help support a small business in my town that could use the business? My cousin works at a computer store and she could probably get me the friends and family discount. Well, this is this is kind of a loaded question about it brings us up to the topic of procurement. Um, it, you know, let's start by answering the question um, in this way. Um, there's no prohibition on ordering on Amazon. Um, the issue is going to be the amount. So we'll talk about thresholds. Anything below $10,000, you could just order on Amazon or order from your favorite store. There's no need to compete it out according to federal regulations. Um, there is a problem with imposing local geographic preferences. That's against the regulations. So you wouldn't want to do that to evaluate your bids. 
And about your cousin, um, we'll talk in a couple minutes about conflicts of interest that might help you get an over, you know, some insight into whether that could be a problem. Because it does sound like a problem. It sounds like your cousin might be getting a benefit and maybe you're, maybe you're closed. So let's go to the next slide, please. And the overview of procurement laws. So if you would represent a state agency, a state university, it's pretty simple for you. You follow your own laws and procedures and policies um, with one exception on recovered goods, but essentially you follow all your procurement um, guidelines. Um, that's really simple, but everybody else, if you don't work at a state agency, you have to follow the federal regulations and I've shown where you can find them to CFR 200.318 through 326. Um, what these say is that, first of all, you have to follow your own written procedures. So you have to have your own written procedures. If you don't have written federal, I mean, um, if you don't have written uh, procurement procedures, um, you, you'll need to get those in order before you do any procurements. Um, and you have to follow the federal regulations. So if there's a conflict between, so let's, let's say that the federal regulations say that you don't have to compete anything if it's $10,000 or less, but your own internal guidelines say that you can only do the non-competitive procurements if it's $5,000 or less. Which one do you follow? Whichever one is stricter. So you have to look at both requirements and make sure that you at a minimum comply with the federal and also um, your own and whichever is stricter. Um, next slide. The key word about procurement and, and federal grants and subgrants is full and open competition as this regulation discusses. So there is a prohibition on certain activities, certain procurement um, methods um, that, that restrict competition. Uh, one of those is a prohibition, um, the, a federal prohibition on contractors that draft statements of work or RFPs, things that are incorporated into the RFP, those contractors can't then compete for that work. So you have to be careful there. Um, there are some other examples. The regulations give that on restrictive competition, like requiring brand names or um, demanding unreasonable requirements to essentially eliminate competition. Um, another one that we see a lot are uh, questions about non-competitive procurements to contractors on retainer. So if you have a contractor on retainer, you can still compete the contract out, but you couldn't award a non-competitive contract to that contractor on retainer. Um, all transactions have to be done at arm's length. Um, and the, the pre-qualified list, sometimes we'll see this, pre-qualified lists are fine, as long as the original um, competition comply with your regulations and the federal, and it's not too old. So what does that mean? Maybe, you know, a year or so old, um, you can use a, you know, pre-qualified list. So let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit about the methods. There are five methods of procuring the federal regulations. Um, you can see the specific regulation here, 0.320. I've already talked about micro purchases. It's everything below 10,000. No need to compete it at all. You can go to your favorite store. Anything between 10,000 and 250,000 is called a small purchase procedure. And you have to get price or rate quotations from an adequate number of qualified sources. Those terms are not defined in the regulations, but it's obviously more than one. Um, and some states have you know, seven requirements of five or seven but you want to get at least two, if not more. And of course, they have to be qualified. Um, that could be an email. You can reach out by email. You can reach out by phone. In this case, you know, if your procurement is less than 250000 for for the federal purposes, it's pretty simple. You just want to make sure you document all the information that you get and, the, and justify the decision that you made. If your procurement is for $250,000 or more, then it's a little more um, demanding. You can use sealed bids or competitive proposals. Um, and, and both of these require um, a, a, a price or a cost analysis. And both of them require um, essentially you to open up the competition to all potential bidders. So it's not just you reach out by phone or email, but you actually open it up um, you know, to the world. Um, the fifth method is actually an exception it's not really a method. We rarely um, um, approve it, but it's called sole source. And that's 
a non-competitive procurement, something available only from one source, like a widget that's only made in one factory someplace, um, or, or an emergency that's a true emergency. So um, if you have any desire or think you might, might need a sole source, you'll definitely need to get approval in writing in advance. Um, but they, just so you know, they are rare. Let's go to the next slide. This is something I wanted to share with you. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, you all are grandfathered in to these regulations. So you can use this bear claw. I'll have to do it for grants that are signed on November 12th or later. But this is something that our analysts often have on their desks to help them. You can see that it's based on price and it just gives you a little, um, a graphic. Um, so next slide. Um, we'll cover conflicts of interest briefly. Um, you mentioned it in the question, my colleague mentioned about her cousin, something to definitely keep in mind regardless of it, whether it's your cousin or, or somebody you have a close relationship with at work, like somebody you're trying to um, negotiate for employment with an organizational conflict of interest. Keep in mind that in the federal regulations, as well as in the ARC code, we have prohibitions on conflicts of interest. So you wanna be really, really careful um, but any decisions that are made by um, at, and anybody on your staff on on, on uh, procurements and awarding of sub awards if they involve uh, immediate family members or like I said um, organizational conflicts of interest perhaps if you're um, somebody's negotiating for work um, if you have any of these you have to tell us about them any potential conflicts of interest let us know and we can help you work through those issues but now we have a question from a colleague on another topic. Hey, Nancy, we're planning on using some of our power grant money to buy some construction equipment to build trails. It's more expensive to rent than it is to buy. But the question is, once we build the trails, can we sell the equipment and keep the money or do we have to return it to ARC? Well, first I have to commend you for choosing to buy rather than rent. If it's less expensive, that shows that you're well, first of all, it could be the other way around. Sometimes it might uh, be, you know, more expensive uh, to uh, to rent, but um, or to buy. But anyway, um, <laughs> right. Regardless, it shows that you're thinking like a a, a good administrator of uh, federal funds and trying to be responsible. So I commend you for that. Um, about selling your equipment after the trails are built, this is a bit more complex. The answer. Um, so let's start by going over some general property standards that apply to all. Um, all awards that um, that use federal funds, ARC funds to buy property equipment and supplies. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so first some definitions. Um, real property is land, um, includes improvements, structures, but not movable machinery and equipment. Um, equipment is essentially tangible property with a life over one year and above $5,000. Supplies are less than that. Um, the main requirements here are first, as I mentioned on the slide, insurance. If you keep insurance on your own property, then you have to keep it on the federally purchased property as well, or the match donated property that's part of the project. I mean, essentially the purpose is to make sure you treat um, things that you acquire with the federal grant this as nicely as you would treat um, things bought with your hard earned money. Um, the second one is an inventory. You'll have to take a physical inventory of your property at least every two years and reconcile those with your records. And that will be looked at. We've had audits where the IG has come out and found no inventory and that, that's written up as an audit finding. So you wanna make sure you can tie and specifically each piece of equipment has to be labeled um, and tracked. Um, and the, the third thing here is the use. Um, so about the use, you have to use any property and equipment and supplies for the originally authorized purpose not just during the life of the grant, but actually essentially almost forever for real property and for equipment, it's until the fair market value of the equipment falls below $5,000. So until that equipment, um, until the equipment's fair market value falls below $5,000, you have to use it for the originally authorized purpose. Um, if anything changes with use, um, you'll have to reach out to us for what are called disposition instructions. And all of this is described in the regulation. This is obviously well in advance. So, you know, but just as a, just so you know, um, up front, um, the use is protected. And why is that so? Why would you have to reach out to us 
for disposition instructions. Um, let's go to the next slide. So this slide describes the ARC property interest. So while um, the real property and equipment you purchase um, vests upon purchase in the grantee and you, the title vests in, in the grantee, we maintain a conditional title. We also have you know, property interest, property rights over that property and equipment. So it's not really just your property because it's purchased with federal funds. Um, in the regulations, it describes the property interest. We've also incorporated these into our code in section 8.8. .8. And as you remember, I, I mentioned, you can find our code online on our website. Um, they're also, uh, this property interest is also incorporated into our grant agreement. And what we require is for all grantees that purchase property, re any real property, any land, building, um, you know, they all have to file what's called a notice of federal interest. We also require that for any equipment purchases over $100,000. So um, this is very, you know, lo location specific. You'll probably have to go to the local courthouse, but it's essentially like a lien that will have ARC's name on the lien. And when that use changes, um, we'll be notified. It won't be clear title. So that's a affirmative requirement now. Um, and it's it's simply because we maintain an interest in that property. Um, and in the disposition instructions, if the use changes, it might mean to transfer property to another eligible grantee or current grantee. Um, it could involve paying us back. Um, you know, there are several different things. We will work with you to figure that out. Obviously, it's not the ideal because we would you know, like to fund projects that are sustainable um, and don't change hands. But anyway, if it comes up, let us know. But let's go to the next topic. Um, next slide, please. The next topic is something that affects all of us um, without, pretty much without exception. Every ARC grant um, requires cost share or match. So it affects all of you. Um, let's talk a little bit about the types of match. Next slide, please. And the types of match here are listed on the side, cash or loans, also in-kind match. Um, this is all described in the regulation 0.306. You can have grantee donated services and property. That's your services and property you donate or third party donations of time, of property, equipment. Um, so those are the types of um, things that can be used as match. Why don't we take a poll to see what you all are planning on using as match for your project? So volunteer time, staff and employee time, 90% of you, wow. And 21% land and building. So it looks like a variety. Um, we do get a lot of match questions. So after this presentation, as I mentioned, feel free to reach out at any time with any questions um, or put them in the chat here. But one of the things you really have to, um, you really have to look at, uh, make sure you get right is, um, is how to value it. So let's go to the a question from a colleague. Nancy, I have some questions about in-kind match. We are planning to use some donated staff time as part of our project's in-kind match, but I'm wondering how do we calculate the value of that time? I'm also wondering if we should include their office space and overhead as part of the match. Um, so any tips you can give me on calculating in-kind match would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. I think this is probably a question that all of you have, at least 90% of you if you're using your own donated staff time. Um, the key thing here, let's go to the next slide as a little information about the valuation of match, at least um, what I think the keywords are, and the keywords are fair market value. Um, how to value match, I really keep that in mind, fair market value. I really strongly re re recommend reading this regulation because it's very specific on how to, um, how to value specific kinds of match. It says, you know, this is how to value your own staff time. This is how to value uh, a third party, a, a, a donate, donor staff time. This is how to value, um, you know, the, the space that you've been donated. It's really specific. It's really very helpful to read this regulation. Um, regarding the staff time, the key here is to um, you can you can count as match those uh, the the I guess the you would say the value of or the the rate of pay that your employee would get for doing this kind of work. If you don't have this kind of work um, internally, nobody in your organization does this kind of work, then you would charge what the going rate is in your labor category, your, your labor market. Um, and it, so, like I said, I, without getting into all the weeds here about how to value every kind of match, I think, um, you know, I think it would keep in mind fair market value. For example, 
if you're using a building, like sometimes we'll get a question like, well, can we value, can we, can we um, use an appraiser uh, to give an appraisal of a building and, and count that whole fair market value of the building um, for our match purposes? But in fact, it, you're really just using the building. It doesn't belong to you and it's not like part of the project. The building's not being donated to the project. So then we would say what well, you could probably use as match the rental value of the space that you're using. Um, so the really fact specific questions, the key here in addition to fair market value though, is to keep all your records, make sure you keep records. If you have anybody working on your grant, whether it's internally and in your organization or a donor, make sure you keep track of them. You have to be able to trace all records. So keep a sign in sheet keep track of their hours. Um, it's really important. Um, okay, so let's see. I think we've kind of covered that topic. Why don't we move on to uh, the next topic, which is indirect costs. Indirect costs, um, probably not everybody on the call has an indirect cost rate, so I won't spend a lot of time on in indirect costs, but I would like to say a couple things. Um, next slide, please. First, we'll start um, with defining indirect costs. Um, direct costs are really those costs that are, kind of are identified specifically with a particular award. Um, they're, you know, they specifically benefit the award. The indirect costs are those that don't, those that um, benefit many you know, joint purposes, common purposes, not specific to your award. The thing to know is that the federal regulations say there's no universal rule for classifying costs as direct or indirect. You just have to be consistent um, you definitely can't double charge. You want to make sure that if you're charging something as an indirect cost, you don't also charge it as a direct cost. Um, and just so you know, um, you might be able to use your unrecovered indirect costs as match if we approve in advance. So let's say that you have an indirect cost rate of 25%, but you're only using 15% for this award. You could choose to, to count that extra 10%. So, um, next slide. If any of you um, are planning on using the 10% rate that you might have heard about, just 10%, blanket 10%, which sounds really simple. It's actually not simple. Um, it is based on what's called the modified total direct costs. Um, it's kind of difficult to maintain because modified total direct costs is defined um, in the regulations and it excludes certain things. So it, it excludes all equipment um, it excludes all sub awards above $25,000. So if you have an award that has um, $500,000 of equipment and $500,000 of sub awards, and you have you know, 100,000 um, for other costs, then it's going to be 10% of that $100,000. So just keep that in mind. It's not based on your whole budget. It's based on this so-called MTDC. But now we have a question from a colleague, so let's go to a question. Hi, Nancy. Here at Bigger Better Biscuit, we received a power grant to train workforce on how to make better biscuits. We have found that if we charge a tuition, they would get better student attendance. My question is, can we use these fees to purchase more dog biscuit making equipment or to fund other dog biscuit programs? Well, I have to say that was a very cute video in addition to a really good question. If you're planning on making money on your grant, it's called program income. So the word program income, now you know what it is. It's money made by virtue of your grant or without which, you know, without your grant, you wouldn't be making. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, some things to know about program income is one, it's encouraged. The regulations encourage it. Why? Because your project becomes more sustainable. If you can make money on it, that's what you want. You want to have an income source. So that's great. The only thing is let us know at the application stage because you'll need to report it throughout your award. Um, so you'll not need to let us know in advance. Um, the normal rule is that program income is deducted from your award. So if you have a $500,000 grant and you made $100,000 on it, you would have to deduct it and make your award $400,000. But that doesn't sound very attractive. That's just if you, the, you know, the default. 
but there's no need to do that because all you have to do is tell us with prior approval, you can add it to your budget. So you can make your $500,000 award a $600,000 award. And you can also use it as match. So you could use that $100,000 to meet your match requirements, which is really good. Um, just you know, wanted to tell you that at the outset, it doesn't have to be used to, you know, to subtract from your award. The other thing about program income, which is interesting, is that after your grant period ends, there's no need to report it. It's no longer program income. You keep it. Um, your grant period ends, uh, all requirements um, regarding program income and reporting cease to exist. So let's go to another question from a colleague. Hey, Nancy, hope things are going well for you in Washington. Hey, I've got a lot of confidence in our team and in our ability to accomplish the goals of our power project, but I'm getting a little bit nervous about some of the ARC requirements. Uh, things like the procurement methodology, the determination and documenting of match, things like tracking the performance measures. So my question to you is, how will we know that we're going about doing all this uh, work correctly? That's a really, really good question. Um, and it's, it's, it's hard to say, but I, I will cover two topics now that will help you. There are actually an additional requirements on you, but if you get these right, um, some other things will also be much, much easier. Um, the first one is, uh, next slide, please. The first one is internal controls. Um, these are required. You have to have controls that give what the keywords are, reasonable assurance that you're managing your award in compliance with the statutes and the regulations and all the grant terms and conditions. And you have to take prompt um, action if there's any non-compliance issues. So um, if your internal controls are giving you this kind of oversight, ability to really keep track of all of the all of the match, you just have to have, I'm not sure exactly what system you use, but you'll need to make sure that it is um, that is effective and that it can later be, you know, um, audited, it can and later be examined. If you if you keep track of everything, you're going to have a much better time of it. Um, it is an area of, that we've seen IG audits on. So um, again, I would definitely pay attention to this regulation and figure out what your organization needs to make sure that you can track everything. The second thing, um, next slide please, is financial management. This is another area that could be um, um, a source of problems. If your financial management system isn't sufficient to prepare reports and trace funds, you could have really big problems during the report, uh, during the project and as, and as well towards the end or at any point when you're audited. So you have to have a financial management system that can identify all the funds, trace everything, um, and you know, be able to report um, accurately throughout the life of the project. Um, the keyword here is, is sufficient. It's a, like I said, a key area for um, the IG. And then kind of following on that is another topic. Next slide. And this is a record retention. Um, this is something that is a, a separate provision in the regulations. You'll need to make sure that you keep all records related to your award. Um, so it will help you, you know, during the award, know how you've made decisions because sometimes awards might last for several years. And you'll, you'll need to go back to those records. Sometimes there might be staff turnover and um, you need to make sure that the records that you keep aren't, they don't disappear, that they're easily found um, regardless of any staff changes. Um, next slide. This, um, this regulation on record retention, um, it, well, regulations, I should say, um, cover the types of records that need to be kept, um, financial procurement, real property, and all of that. Um, and also they discuss the length of time. You have to keep them for a minimum of three years after project closeout. If there's any issue like an audit is open or there's any litigation or any kind of difficulty like that, um, three year actually don't, doesn't apply. It could be longer. Um, so you have to keep them three years from the date that the audit closes or the date the litigation ends. Um, in addition, uh, let's go to um, the next slide. Um, Post-grant requirements. This is something that we want to make sure that you're aware of, something that ARC does. Um, next slide. We require cooperation with our contractors. We hire contractors that come out and they're looking at program outcomes. They evaluate grants, but it could be actually four years, sometimes five years after project closeout. And you'll have to cooperate with them. So this is another reason why you want to keep your your records because if you want to show the successes in our region while the regulations don't require five-year record retention um we we really would like to be able to show where our money is going and how it's affecting the region so 
we encourage you to keep records for longer than, than three years. Um, let's go to some of these. Um, so some of your uh, your favorite topic. Um, it's uh, audits. Next slide, please. So audits. Um, not sure if any of you have ever been audited. It's it's not any fun, but um, uh, that's another reason why we want to provide this great training to you up front. And we're um, on the legal on the legal issues to make sure that if you are audited, um, that it's uh, as pleasant as it as it could possibly be. And if you have um, if you follow all this guidance, it will be a lot more pleasant. Um, we have an office of inspector general. Next slide, please which um, is an office that's in every federal agency, over 70 um, federal agencies and departments have an Office of Inspector General. Um, they were created in 1978, originally with the, just 12, and now there are a lot more. Um, and they have authority to go in and audit. They, they do criminal investigations, they do inspections on any programs and operations that we conduct. All of our, all of our programs and operations are subject to this, um, our code also incorporates um, some of the um, language from the Inspector General Act. But as I mentioned at the outset, we have um, a visit by our Inspector General, and I'd like to introduce um, Inspector General Phil Hennigan. I'll turn it over to Phil right now, and he can tell you more about his office. Thank you, Nancy. It's great to be here, wherever here actually is. Uh, up here, uh, you see, I've been the inspector general since March of this year. So I came into the office uh, two weeks before the pandemic hit. And uh, so it's been an interesting learning experience for me about how ARC works remotely. Um, I have some contact information up here, which will be available in the slides, including a hotline. Uh, next slide, please. So what is an office of inspector general? Um, it's, it's a pretty unique situation. I'm part of ARC, and yet I report to the entire commission and Congress. Um, I get to select the work that I'm gonna do. I decide what, who, when, where to audit. Um, I select my staff. I select my contractors. Of course, I have to follow all those rules that you just heard about from Nancy uh, in terms of selecting a contractor. Um, but I report to Congress every six months on, on what's, what's going on at ARC. So my mission is to promote and preserve the efficiency, effectiveness, and integrity of ARC. Um, so the five words there that are really important to me are the promote and preserve. Promote says if we find something wrong, we're going to try to fix it. Preserve, equally important. When we see things are being done right and well, we want to we want to talk about that just as much as where they're not going well. Um, so we look at the efficiency, the effectiveness of the program, but most critically, the integrity of the commission. And, and why is the integrity important? Because that's how the dollars keep flowing. Um, if, if Congress is concerned at all that the ARC doesn't follow the rules and issuing the grants and is just shoveling money out the door, um, then they're not going to be as interested in keep to keep funding ARC. So it's important from an integrity point of view that Congress looks at us and knows we're being good stewards of the tax dollars. Um, and, and on that front, when we look at our audits, 90% of our audits find no problems at all. And what does that mean? That means you all passed a good test because ARC does a pretty good job of vetting who it's going to select to give its money to. Um, and consequently, there tend to be fewer problems. Uh, and 90% without having a problem, that's a pretty good record. Uh, and when there are problems, they're usually pretty minor and they can be fixed. But it's important for ARC to uh, to go out and address those problems when they happen, because that's the that's how they they earn the integrity is because they tell all of you to follow these rules. And if one grantee isn't following them, they go out and say, no, you got to follow the rules. We got to fix this problem. Um, so that's important. So what um, where do you see me? Where would you see me is 
basically in an audit situation. And how does that audit process work? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start by sending out an announcement letter. And with that letter, I'll say, here's a survey, kind of answer a lot of the questions Nancy just was talking about, about you know, what, what's your accounting system? How do you do indirect rates? Do you have your inventories? Things like that. So that we kind of have a better idea going out before the audit gets conducted of what we're gonna encounter uh, at your site. So the auditors would come on site of course, I have to put a parenthetical here with the whole um, pandemic thing. We are looking at other ways to conduct the audits. So we may, uh, we may start doing desk reviews um, and not, not always go out to the site. But we, we do the field work and traditionally that has been go to the site, verify all the documents and then, uh, and then we would issue a draft report requesting comments from the grantee uh, and then we would go ahead and issue a final, uh, a final report. Um, if there's any really bad shenanigans going on, then we might have to do an investigation. Uh, and that's a whole different can of worms and, and that doesn't really happen very often at all. Um, but that's the process of the Office of the Inspector General. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Nancy. Okay. I tell you what, what we'll do as a follow-up for the Q&A is we'll write out the questions and then Nancy can provide a written answer to that. Um, and we'll send that out to all the attendees as well. Because um, there were some great questions about procurement and sole sourcing and, um, and um, record keeping and whatnot. Um, so before I uh, send you off, I just wanna thank everyone for participating. Um, this will conclude our session. Uh, remember, next week on Thursday at 11 o'clock, we are going to have the final or the third session on Project Implementation 101. And that will be led by a group of ARC staff, your program managers and the an analysts. And they're going to touch on ways to make your project succeed in the first 90 days, set you up for success. Um, we'll also have time for folks to get together uh, who are doing like projects. So all the folks that are doing on workforce projects or substance use disorder projects, you'll have an opportunity to meet each other visually or, or virtually rather and um, talk about issues that you might encounter unique or that are distinct to your project type. Um, I also want to say we got a few questions about basic agencies. We'll have a separate, uh, separate breakout room, a uh, virtual breakout room for grantees that are working with state and federal basic agencies. Because I know the situation and this, uh, the issues you have are different than projects that have ARC staff administering those projects. So um, without further ado, I thank you all and appreciate your time and um, have a great afternoon. <laughs>